Welcome everyone. The topic for today is aviation and greenhouse gas. In the bracket is GHG. Yeah, this is the um, a, a small form, and the abbreviation is greenhouse gas pollution, which is caused by the aviation emissions. So, as you know, that the topic of sustainability is a is a vast field. Everybody talks about sustainability, so we need to know a little bit more about the origin of uh, this whole concept of greenhouse gas and how it is actually affecting the environment and therefore also affecting our industry, uh, our way of life, our social economy that is also involved. So one of the main roles um, the, um, played by the aviation is the reduction of GHG gases or emissions. And among them, why are we also focusing so much on carbon dioxide? Um, you know, so this is the factors that we're going to look at in this um, webinar. So, hello world. I'm sure that everybody knows what's hello world, right? When you start your computer program, you will always start with hello world, right? So this is the pale blue dot. Yeah, this is like, like what Carl Sagan says, right? The earth is a pale blue dot when it's looked from the outer space, from the moon, from the outer space. Look at how beautiful it is. It is so unique. It's got clouds. It's filled with water, right? More than 70% of the Earth's body is actually filled with water. And the environment is, it is so conducive for life thriving on Earth. Understanding the greenhouse gas. So this presentation will go on several sections. Section number one is the physical science of greenhouse gas, the introduction of a greenhouse gas. And section two, is the GHG pollution from aviation emissions. Section three, we will be looking at the, uh, in a summary, the effects of GHG pollution. And section four will be the mitigating actions that has to be taken by aviation industry. How do we mitigate the actions? And also, I have also included in the last section, it's a, it's a brief introduction to IPCC. Um, I'm sure that many of you would have heard the name, um, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. They are the one uh, responsible for issuing all the assessment reports. We will also briefly go through the, uh, the main structure of IPCC so that everybody has a general understanding. Now, the first and foremost is the discovery of greenhouse gas. There were two scientists actually kind of uh, really involved in the discovery of greenhouse gas in the earlier. The first is Joseph Fourier. Joseph Fourier was a French mathematician. He studied the heat flow and its effects on Earth's temperature. He determined that the Earth needed an insulating blanket and he reasoned that Earth's blanket of air, which shields us from the harshness of space in many ways, acts like an insulator. He considered the example of a box with a glass cover. The air inside the box heats up when exposed to sunlight. Now we'll go to the next scientist, Niels Gustav Alcon. Right, greenhouse gas of effect coined by this Swedish meteorologist, Niels Gustav Alcon, after greenhouses, which are essentially glass boxes that store heat from the sun to produce a temperate environment for the plants inside, right? As you can see here, this is what we call the greenhouse, right? Like a lot of people have seen it, yeah? Uh, greenhouse is basically a building designed to protect tender or out of season plants against excessive cold, cold or heat. So they, they started this in, in countries like in Europe <clears throat> where they have uh, too much of temperature during the cold winter time. And in order to preserve the heat, that's when they built um, what they call the greenhouse. So the reason, actually, uh, the reason for the choice was unfortunate that the greenhouse glass, uh, now that we use glass, basically, and it keeps the inside air warm in large part because it traps the warm air heated by the sun inside of it. Whereas on Earth, the warm air is free to rise by convection or transporting heat upward by conduction. 
Absorbing heat radiation before it escapes is very, very important for both greenhouses and the Earth's atmosphere. So we will see about the Earth's atmosphere in the subsequent slides. So just in short, this is what we meant by a greenhouse. The, the effect created by the greenhouse is what we call the greenhouse effect. So in terms of the Earth, we say greenhouse effect, greenhouse gas effect is global warming, right? So we have greenhouse gas effect, which is localized, and then we have global warming, and the climate change. Thereafter is climate change. Your climate change is much, much bigger than that. So we have the greenhouse gas effect, global, global, um, global, global effects, and global warming, and then climate change. The why does this different different type? There are many types of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and we are going to see one by one among three most prominent um, greenhouse gases. The first is methane, right? Methane has a residence time of 12 years in the atmosphere. We all know about methane because during the time of dinosaurs, right? So a lot of methane is being produced through the vegetation and then they eat and then when they secrete and it produces a lot of methane. So we know that methane is also the effect now that we have problems with methane, especially in cattle farming, where the cattles, they burp and they produce a lot of methane. Methane is potentially dangerous. It is also a GHG, but however, how long does it remain in the atmosphere? That's what we say residence time. It is 12 years. The next, we are looking at nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is also a very bad GHG, right? So these are among the classes of GHG, which is massively being produced. And nitrous oxide exceeds 100 years of residence time in the atmosphere. Once it's released, it stays, unless it is um, mechanically removed, right? It stays. Then third is carbon dioxide. We all talk about CO2. Why all CO2? CO2 CO2 has a residence time of 100,000 years and above. Right? So that's the reason why the CO2 is the principal GHG because it also contributes to 85% of the total emissions, making it the most dominant GHG emitted globally. So you have a clear understanding now what is the meaning of residence time. It's a time that remains in the atmosphere. We are just going to briefly have a look at all these GHGs, uh, what we call greenhouse gases. There are many, many greenhouse gases. And uh, as described, carbon dioxide, right? So methane, nitrous oxide, these are the three main uh, GHGs. And thereafter, we have something, uh, other gases, what we call the F gases. F gases is because it all contains fluoride, sulfur hexafluoride, hydrocarbon hexafluoride, uh, fluorocarbon 23, hydrofluorocarbon 32, perfluoromethane, perfluoroethane, propane, butane, and so on and so on. There are many, many different types of greenhouse gases, actually, this is the most, but the first three have the strongest effect for Earth and in the atmosphere. Among these three, carbon dioxide. So there's a reason why we always speak about carbon dioxide. Our concern is carbon dioxide because it is the principal gas and it's 85% of all industries, among all, it's, that's the one that's produced. And in this chart, if you see, of course, it gives you the formula. And then the next chapter, the, on the next section, it tells you the 100-year GWP. GWP stands for Global Warming Potential, which is calculated as 100 years. And then we have AR4. This is extracted from the IPCC assessment report for, which will, we will reintroduce this chart again at the um, next stage when we understand how this mechanism works. All right, on this slide, we are going to be discussing briefly about what we call energy budget from the very big perspective here. Yeah? So you can see from the energy budget over here in this section, we have 100% incoming radiation. And you can see what all happens to all this radiation, like right? 49% is absorbed, 
22% is absorbed by water, vapor, dust, ozone. Right, so 49% is absorbed by the earth, and some of them are again like you no know, outgoing radiation. When we talk about outgoing radiation, you have 8% that is like scattered by the air, reflected by the clouds, about 14%, right, reflected by the lake, by the water bodies, water bodies, 7%. You know, there's long wave radiation and different different types where it's actually um, emitting it back. That's why our atmosphere is so important. Because what will happen if we don't have an atmosphere? And it's here. A greenhouse gas is actually a gas that absorbs and emits radiation, radiant energy in the atmosphere, thus calling the so-called greenhouse effect on Earth. Without the greenhouse effect caused by the gases, the temperature on Earth would be much lower and in life in general, much colder. It's actually about minus 19 degrees Celsius on average, in fact. And actually, this is also the, temp the average temperature of the moon because the moon doesn't have atmosphere. It takes all the radiation, the body absorbs it, and then it gives back. So some is retained, some is sent back. So in general, even in moon, the average temperature is minus 19 degrees Celsius. Okay, now when we talk about this um, CO2, right, why CO2, why water vapor, they seem to be more, have more effects on the temperature compared to oxygen and nitrogen or, or even other gases, right? So it's because of the way the arrangements of the atoms. If you look at oxygen and nitrogen molecules, they don't absorb much infrared radiation while CO2 and H2O do. It's because of what we call the bending forces, the way they vibrate. If you look at oxygen and nitrogen, okay, water and CO2, H2O and CO2, the bending, the bending vibration is much slower. So because they are slower, so the lower frequency infrared radiation can excite these vibrations. As such, the CO2 and H2O preferentially absorb, ab absorb in the infrared. They're in the infrared region, they are more absorbed. We will see the graph of this. And if you look at O2 and N2, the way the bending vibration, the bending vibration is much faster. So the frequency that it actually um, emits is a higher frequency. Like, okay, in this graph, you can actually see the absorption percentage and the types of absorption that it absorbs, right? So in, in oxygen and ozone, O3 is ozone, O2 and ozone, it absorbs ultraviolet much more readily, right? So, but when it goes to near infrared and infrared at a certain point, yes, it does maybe at a certain temperature or the way the molecule or atom behaves. But other than that, generally ultraviolet is the most predominant. If you compare that with CO2 and water vapor, in the sense is there is literally none ultraviolet, but when, it, when we introduce infrared, visible, visible far infrared, the grass just spikes. This is caused by the bending forces within the atom and how it absorbs. So that's the reason why CO2 and water vapor, from the atomic and the molecular perspective, it can create more heat compared to the other gases. The next is the introduction of carbon footprint. We all know the word carbon footprint. It is actually derived from a much bigger word. It's called ecological footprint. Then of course, from ecological footprint, um, the um, climate change body have adopted uh, something what we call the carbon footprint. And the word carbon itself came from the word carbon dioxide because we are, since that is the most prominent gas. And this is the footprint. This is the picture of a footprint and why that, that's the reason why it's called carbon footprint. Yeah? So as we can see here in the footprint itself, right? so we have many sections of the footprint. And um, of course, we can see the toes, the different types of toes here. We have gas, electricity, exhaust pipe. It's all denoted by the sizes, the various sizes. And we see the food industry. Oh yeah, it does have a substantial uh, amount of uh, carbon footprint. And flying alone, you know, from the among the footprint, flying alone is a big chunk, 
right? And then you have other stuffs and other things. And we can see here, aviation globally contributes 3% of total emissions of CO2 and is projected to increase between 200% to 900% by 2050 if the aviation industry does not act. There is a lot more low-cost carriers are coming up. Airlines are new, new airlines are coming up. People are becoming more and more affluent. They are well-connected. They can readily travel. The more the aircraft flies, the higher amount of CO2 that is being emitted in the higher atmosphere. Right? So what is the big difference, actually? The significant difference between commercial vehicles and aviation is that aircraft's exhaust gases are emitted above the planetary boundary layer. Now it's about two kilometers above in the upper troposphere and the lower troposphere. Between the upper and the lower, sorry, between the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. <clears throat> we will see this now. Okay, this is the layers of atmosphere. This is where the aircraft flies, right? So we are talking about a two kilometers <clears throat> up here, right? So it's much, much lower. It's between the two kilometers is the most prominent. That's when it starts. The emission is above two kilometers. It's very hard to study the emissions about, about two kilometers and above. So we say that the aircraft basically, the, uh, it is at the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. So this is the effect. And you can see that the ozone layers, right? O3, O3 ozone layer is at about 25, between 25 to 50 kilometers. We all heard about the ozone layer and the way the ozone layer is getting destroyed. When the ozone layer is destroyed, it allows radiation to penetrate directly, unshielded, unprotected. We have so many other effects as well, as you can see, right? So we have the volcanic effects, which is also now it's going to increase because of the um, climate change effects. And you can see here at this range, lots of, lots of, lots of clouds on this line. Okay, so this is the layers of atmosphere. And the next section, when you see here on this part of the aircraft which is flying, is called contrails. We hear the word says contrails. It actually stands for condensation trails. This is caused by the aerosols. Aerosols are also types of emissions of the um, <clears throat> exhaust gas. Yeah, it's also kind of a pollutant, but however, these aerosols have severe effects much in a higher altitude. Nevertheless, the aerosols, they have a residence time which is much lower than CO2 and they are not um, much more, um, what we say, predominant compared to the CO2. And a part of the science of uh, global warming, climate change, global warming in CO2 carbon footprint, we will hear the words what we call carbon dioxide equivalent, right? So it's abbreviated as CO2 equivalent. It's actually a metric measure used to compare the emissions of various greenhouse gases on the basis of global warming potential right? by converting amounts of other gases to the equivalent amount of carbon dioxide in the same global warming. So in short, what does it mean? We use the word carbon dioxide equivalent because we don't want to use, um, we don't want to mention the uh, other, other gases. We know that other, other gases that we have seen, right? all the GHGs, they all have effects. Uh, however, we take carbon dioxide as a factor and then we measure the other gases in comparison with the CO2, right? And then we call it global warming potential, right? What is its effect, global warming potential equivalent to the carbon dioxide? And what is global warming potential by itself? Global warming potential or GWP, it was developed to allow comparisons of the global warming impacts on different types of gases. So it actually measures how much energy the emission of, let's say, for example, one ton of gas will absorb over a given period of 100 years. We take a factor of 100 years, one ton of gas, 100 years, relative to the emission of one ton of carbon dioxide, 100 years. All right, so we will go back to the same graph that we saw earlier. As you can see, now it shows like, um, we have the 100 year global warming potential of different different types of gases. Now we can see that the factor, the carbon dioxide is one, yeah, the ratio is one. Methane is 25. So what does it mean? It means that methane, let's say one kilogram of methane is equivalent to 25 kilograms of carbon dioxide. That's how bad it is, right? Nitrous oxide, 
one kilogram of nitrous oxide is equal to 298 kilograms of carbon dioxide. And then it goes on and on and on. And if you see in this complete list here among the F gases, the worst is sulfur hexafluoride. Sulfur hexafluoride has a factor of 22,800. That means one kilogram of sulfur hexafluoride can and is equal to 22,800 kilograms of carbon dioxide. But perhaps, of course, sulfur hexafluoride is something that is very rare. It used to be used in tennis balls before to get the bounciness. Even Nike Air was using sulfur hexafluoride before to give a fantastic effect on the Nike shoes. They stopped using it because of this uh, detrimental effects to the environment. So as you can see, that all the different, different types of gases and its effects. Yeah, so we have a general idea of what is global warming potential is. Right, so is it true, is it real? What is the measurement of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere at the moment? So if you did take this chart, right? So this chart at the moment is giving to year on year, atmospheric, uh, the PPM, that is concentration parts per million of the CO2. If you take from the year 1955, all the way to up to year 2022 in January, right? So you can see the perfect, beautiful line uninterrupted, so nice. It kept going up, right? And then it, it, it actually hit 350. It's 350 somewhere in 1986, and between 1985 to 1990, it's going up, right? A lot more countries, a lot more countries are becoming industrial. As a lot of more countries becoming industrial, a lot more emissions of CO2, and the, of course, it's going increasing in January 2022, right? So the, actually the current PPM concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is 417.99, it's about 418 PPMs. This is the latest report taken from the Mauna, Mauna Observatory in Hawaii. Okay, <clears throat> some of us say that the uh, global warming is fake news, right? So if you, if you look at CO2 concentration, PPM, what we saw just now, we know now it's what 480 ppm. Now we are now taking this from over CO2 during ice ages and warm periods for the last 800,000 years. Okay, you can see from 800,000 years before, it never breached even 300. It was always there for hundreds of thousands of years. The CO2 ppm concentration in the atmosphere has remained marginally much lower than 300 except at one point highest previous concentration 300 ppm that's uh, somewhere around uh, 200,000 years ago and you can see here the warm glacial period ice age right see that the one more thing is that ice age during the time of ice age of the glacial period the carbon dioxide concentration was much lower and of course, it's an, it's an argument. They say that the CO2 is so important to prevent the Earth from going through the next ice age. We will come to that later as a point as well, which is a plus point for the CO2. And you can see that sudden change, sudden change happened, right? It dropped and then it went on and on and on. And thank you very much for the Industrial Revolution, which drove up so many things from the 1700s. And it never stopped, right? It never stopped. It just gradually moved up. And we are at this more than 400 ppm the concentration at the moment. Okay, in terms of temperature, we have seen the concentration of the CO2 in the atmosphere. So what does it mean? What does it relate to in the terms of temperature? Let's just look at this 1970 to 215 linear trend. Right. From linear trend that we can see between 1970 to 2015, Right. So you can see that it was less than 0 0.5 degrees global mean temperature, and it has now gone up by one degree. And as we know from the latest assessment report, AR6, which was released by IPCC yes, last year, IPCC has warned and they have changed the uh, requirement to 1.5 degrees compared to two degrees before. They say an increase of two degrees will be detrimental, but last year's report 
uh, has reduced that to 1.5. So by 2030, by 2050, we need to make sure that we have to remain between 1.5, otherwise there will be a lot of uh, catastrophic changes to the atmosphere. So remember that 1.5 is the keyword in climate change. Now, in terms of the um, amount of CO2 gigatons that is being produced, and we can also see that gradually from the 1960s all the way up, it has always been projected to go up and up and up. And it has been in a rising trend. So we have seen the temperature in rising trend. We have seen the CO2 concentration in rising trend. And now we see the CO2 amount that is being emitted. So it's also in rising trend. So it looks like it's real, yeah, data. Is true. Data does not lie, it shows the fact. Another graph that I'm going to share with you is this uh, recent graph. As you can also see that the global daily fossil uh, CO2 emissions, as you can see the CO2 emission has been steadily increasing. Oops, but somehow in 2020, there is a drop. Right? There's a sharp drop in 2020. It shows, it shows that this is the COVID-19 in 2020, when the COVID-19 came it stopped the world for a momentary period. That was the time the earth could actually breathe back normal, right? So of course, a lot of people died during the COVID-19, but for earth, it was a different moment. The, the amount of CO2 that was being emitted just dropped. You can see that you can drop like from 90 to less than 80 metric ton CO2. Okay. Now we are coming to section two. Section two is about GHG pollution from the aviation emissions. We have seen in the section one about the science of greenhouse gas. So in section two, we're going to be focusing more on aviation emissions. Jet fuel, right, is the burning problem. Gas turbine engines emissions. Gas turbine engine, as you know, that we use. Um, jet A1, Jet A, Jet B, JPA, F gas, and many, many different types more. Well, the military aircraft, they use different, different types, but most prominent type that is being used is Jet A1 and Jet A. And as we know, this is, we are still using what we call fossil fuel. Fossil itself means, in Latin, is obtained by digging. Right. So in this, we can, uh, in this diagram, you will see the air intake, which is oxygen, nitrogen, and of course the atmospheric gas, which is being burnt by the combustion in the combustion chamber, injected by the aviation fuel mixed with the air. And the most important is the emissions, right? So when we talk about emissions or aircraft pollution, right? So here we are talking about CO2 pollution and the other gases, of course, it's coming, the only source it can come from this is from the exhaust gas. But there are other factors which affects the amount of emissions, like for example, the drag and so on, the airframes and technology and so on. Right. So we can see the, uh, the, the greenhouse gas is being emitted here, it's water and CO2. We have air, we have also products of what we call the incomplete combustion. We have carbon monoxide, which is toxic. Yes, it's toxic even on ground as, a, as the aircraft comes in, right? When the aircraft comes in, the engines are not shut down yet. At that time, the uh, people who are on the tarmac, they're fully exposed for these kind of gases. You have UHC, which is unburnt, unburnt hydrocarbons. And we also have uh, particulate matters, we call it PM. They are also bad, they are also quite bad. They also have CSU, for example, this is what we call the black carbon. SOX gases, smokes, NO2, NOx gases, basically in general. So this is what is being produced by the jet engine, whether it is on ground or whether it is in flight. Okay, in this slide here, uh, we will be seeing, for example, it's, a, it's, it's called the mass of anthropic gas emissions from gas turbine engine combustion. The air intake, for example, if it's 800, 850,000 kilograms of air, and the, um, there's an amount of fuel which is being injected, right? And we have in we have cold air. The air, the air, the aircraft engine is uh, divided into two sections. What we call the primary and the and the bypass. Secondary, 
The primary is the core engine, that is where the burning happens. So the burning happens here and then it emits what we call the hot air and 130,000 kilograms of hot air and there are 722,700 kilograms of cold air. And among, among that, you can see the different, different amounts of all these gases that are being produced just from the atmosphere. Yeah, just from the atmosphere. Atmosphere mixed with the jet fuel, yeah? Because jet fuel has, contains a lot of carbon, right? It's fossil fuel carbon. And if we take in terms of percentage, from the mass to the percentage calculation, and we know that we can see that CO2 contributes about 71.8% of the total emission. Then we have water vapor, which is 27.9%, and then we have other, other minor gases. Right. So this again it proves that why CO2 is actually the prominent, the I'm sorry, the principal or the dominant gas that is uh, the most detrimental. In section three, we are going to be looking at the different effects of uh, CO2 to the environment. Okay, just a quick takeaway of the types of uh, what, what CO2 has done to the earth. Around 65 million years ago, the CO2 concentration was 100 1290 ppm and at that time sea level was sea levels they were 73 meters higher than now so you can imagine yeah at that time how it was then 23 million years ago the co2 decreased to 500 ppm sea level subsided 28 meters higher than present that is at 500 ppm yeah, it's a mark there. And 21,000 years ago, at maximum glacial point, like the what we saw in the graph governor earlier, sea level was, was 130 meters lower than now at maximum glacial point. That's during the ice age time. Now, the effects. The loss of, the loss of Greenland's complete ice sheet will cause a rise of sea level by seven meters. This is just Greenland alone, yeah? Greenland alone, if it loses green, they call, we call it Greenland, but it's not green, it's filled with ice. Similar to Iceland, we call it ice, but it has more Greenland. So Greenland is completely filled with ice, but if they melt, the sea level will rise by seven meters high. And imagine if it is seven meters, so many nations, countries, will be submerged, like Jakarta will be gone, uh, Netherlands, Florida, right? So I think that's one of the factors why Jakarta, the, the Indonesian government is looking towards uh, building a completely new capital because Jakarta is pretty low, right? It's, it's near, very near to sea level, almost, almost very, very close to the sea level. So countries like even like, uh, like Jordan, where you have the Dead Sea, they are also above, they are below the sea level actually. You know, so a lot of countries will just simply submerge into water when this happens. If the CO2 emissions continues at the same rate till the end of this century, the sea level rise will be about one meter high, right? If the, if the same trend continues until this century, one meter high sea level. You want one meter high is enough. It will invade the a lot of land mass areas. And at the present rate, it is estimated that the temperature will increase by three degrees Celsius by 2050, which will cause the death of 99% of the corals on the tropical beach. So at the current rate, the way it is going, the temperature will increase by three degrees. So that's the reason by 2050. That's the reason why IPCC has kept it at 1.5. Right? It's so important to give it 1.5. And from the aviation's perspective, we are the Airbus, Boeing, they are doing a lots and lots of experiments to ensure that they can abide by the 1.5 as they are the all the, most of the countries are the signatories of the Paris Agreement. So it is at this Paris Agreement, it was agreed that the the, the, the nations will adhere to 1.5.
And of course, 99% of the corals in the tropical ocean will be disappeared. So for those of you who have not done a snorkeling or scuba diving, I suggest you take it now because the chances are your great-grandchildren, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren will not even see the beautiful corals that's available in Sepadan Island, Teoman, Redang. An increase in CO2 concentration leads to an increase in carbonic acid, just yes, sea's carbonic acid levels, which lowers the sea's, uh, seawater's pH, right? So we have the pH uh, between one to seven, which is acidic, seven is neutral, seven and above is uh, alkaline, and pH stands for the potential of hydrogen. And we know that the higher the carbonic acid levels in the sea, right? So the EC becomes more acidic and then it creates severe biological consequences. You might not even have the fish anymore, or maybe the fish will actually uh, evolve into something else, right? Something much more to, in order for their own survival. So a lot of things can change. Carbonic acid itself is being produced is because of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then when it rains, the rainwater actually then brings down the carbon dioxide, it goes into the sea, it becomes carbonic acid. This carbonic acid goes down into the seabed and then it joins into the tectonic plates, masses, and then it goes up to the mountains. And for example, the volcanoes, right? The volcanic activities. The volcano actually is a buildup of pressure inside the volcano. So the higher the carbonic acid level gives more carbonic gases inside the uh, volcanoes, the mountains. So the higher the pressure, the more activities you will see. You will, we will start seeing a lot more volcanic activities as the global, as the amount of CO2 keeps rising up more and more and more. Section four, we have come to the point of um, mitigation actions. What can we do? especially in terms of the aviation industry. Uh, the ICAO, that is the International Civil Aviation Organization, the governing body, it, it recommends four different ways to, uh, to achieve CO2 reduction. The first is through the technological innovations by redesigning the airframe, the propulsion system, and so on. And next is the operational procedures that is being used by the airlines and uh, the uh, infrastructure to reduce the fuel burn, improvement in infrastructure, including air traffic management system, and also what does the airline itself do in order to do that, the reduction of weight, and many things that we will see this gradually, single engine taxi, Right, they, they can taxi in with a single engine rather than coming in with two engines, right, or three engines, four engines, and more efficient engines, and so on. Use of sustainable aviation fuel and other clean energy, like for example, electric propulsion. And um, yeah, of course, we will be um, there will be topics on sustainable aviation fuel, which will be discussed by the um, other members in in um, coming uh, webinars. And finally, the implementation of carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation or COSIA, right? So COSIA is a body. And what, what do we mean by carbon offset? Carbon offset means what can we do to help to offset to remove the carbon dioxide, right? So uh, most of the carbon offsetting, we know that uh, the airlines, they introduce carbon offset in the ticket as well. They ask you when you're purchasing a ticket, do you also want to contribute to carbon offset? That money that is collected will be used to, for example, um, plant a tree in somewhere in a country, in a dedicated land, or any other projects that they can do in order to offset the carbon that is being emitted, right, by the airlines in that flight. Like, like for example, Etihad Airways, right? Etihad uh, is the airline that um, I'm in. So we publish the how much amount of CO2 is going to be emitted in this flight. So with that, then we say that okay, do you want to purchase a carbon offset? Um, if you choose to purchase a carbon offset, then that money will go to like uh, growing the mangrove. Like we, uh, Etihad Airways has taken the initiative of growing um, a mangrove uh, trees in the mangrove in the mangrove village. 
the mangroves and algae, for example, we don't do algae, and algae are known to actually absorb a lot more carbon dioxide, a lot. So there are a lot of other airlines are doing different different types of carbon offsetting, and also other industries are also doing what we call the carbon offsets. And actually, what is our role in carbon offsets? Right, our role in carbon offset is we just breathe the earth. If you have land, if you're at home, you have some land. Why leave it barren and empty? Right, you have to put up a tree. You know, plant a tree. Let it. Let, that's our part of carbon offsetting. Okay, when we are talking about this uh, first section, that is the technological advancements in the airlines. Like, for example, the first um, among the, the most prominent that we can see is the reduction of weight. So, fully composite airframe, lightweight fiber. In the picture here, what we see is the, actually the Beach Starship 1 in the early 1980s. The Beach Starship 1, it was the first all composite airplane to obtain FAA certification. The first time. The next is among the big jets, among the big jets and big planes, right? So uh, most of the airlines have experimented by using sections, only certain sections of the aircraft with the uh, composite material. But whenever we take uh, the Boeing 787, the 787, which uh, entered into service in the year 2011, as you can see that uh, the uh, they do have aluminium in certain sections. They do, they still use aluminium. But however, the complete body of the fuselage of the aircraft that you can see that is marked black here, including the wings, yeah, it's made by carbon laminate or what we call the um, CFRP, carbon reinforced um, fiber. And we have carbon sandwich in certain sections, fiberglass in certain sections as well and multiple materials for example in pylon they have to put because pylon is uh, holds the engine it still requires a lot of uh, metals because it, it, the, the weight of the engine and then it absorbs the thrust the drag and the weight of the engines and so on so this might still need to use a certain metal like titanium and you have the quad sandwich quad sandwich is used as a radar and we can say that this aircraft is so light so light compared to its predecessor uh, its predecessor is, for example, the Boeing 777. The Boeing 777 is a full aluminium metal aircraft. Of course, certain sections are fiberglass. Other than that, it's, it's a full scale, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful plane, but it's much heavier compared to the Boeing 787. 787 is a grand success in terms of fuel reduction. And of course, Airbus also has introduced their own uh, aircraft, which is the Airbus A350, which is fantastic, which is also very, very good in terms of the weight and the range it can give and the lesser fuel it burns, the lesser CO2 emissions. Okay, when it comes to the engine itself, the engine itself, we can, we will look at the um, technological advancements of, by using ultra high bypass turbofan and the geared turbofan. So in the picture here, we see the, uh, it's a, this is a PNW 1000. Uh, GTF, okay, um, we can see the different types of gear ratios that is being used here. Um, there is a different purpose. This is actually for the reduction of noise with a low speed, low pressure, high bypass, high bypass ratio as well. Yes, it's the, it's, it's the GTF 1000 by PNW. It's got a ultra high bypass with a ratio over 12, 12. We will see later in the next chapter. In the next slide, we will see the low bypass as well. And you can see the high, ultra high bypass, very, very big, the ratio. What is this bypass? Like what we, uh, I have um, briefly mentioned earlier, the bypass is the amount of air that is passing through the core and in ratio to the one passing through the secondary, right? So the by bypass ratio that is 12, one to 12, one, uh, one is the core ingestion and over 12 is going through the secondary and it's, it's got a very specially built low emission combustion, right? So different way of mechanism of dealing with this. And of course, uh, here it is actually purely for the noise reduction, where this, they use, that's why it's called geared turbofan, uh, right? It's got, a, um, it's got a fan drive system with the gear, three gear ratios in order. So what it does is, is it actually, actually controls, it prevents the fan tip speed 
from reaching Mach 1, that is the speed of sound. So it because it, it is always less than Mach 1, which means the noise emitted by the fan blades are very, very less decibels, yeah, very quiet. So the combination of the UHB and, and uh, GTF uh, reduces the effective perceived decimal decibels but up to 25, low temperature oxidation, NOx by 75%, and then the efficiency in the fuel burn itself is 25%. As you can see, the graph here, this is the evolution of different types of engines. By This is the courtesy of Pratt & Whitney. You can see here from the earlier times, from the 1960s, you, we have like, for example, the 727, the 727 was using JTAD with a bypass ratio 1 to 1. Right, so you compare that, and you know it has the uh, what had what had is done now. So then they introduce uh, high bypass turbo fans, and now we have moving into the era of ultra high bypass GTF engine, and the benefits lower fuel consumptions. So the lesser the fuel it consumes, so the lesser is the CO two emission, the lower the NOx, and lower the cost. Right, so all these things are the part of sustainability, right? So we, the, the goal is to reduce the CO2. So what do we do, right? So this is one of the technologies, CO2, NOx, lower NOx as well. NOx, as we've seen, it's also a GHG gas. It's more prominent in higher altitudes um, when the engines are actually at a much higher power setting. Uh, the NOx is more prominent compared to being in idle. Okay, the next is the electric propulsion system in terms of technological advancement. Okay, one example here is the uh, Magni X, the Cessna, the, the, the E caravan, the, the 208B Cessna Grand Caravan, uh, developed in partnership with Aerotech, powered by 750 horsepower Bentley 500 propulsion system. It became the world's biggest. Ever all electric commercially focused aircraft as it takes from the skies at Moses Lake, Washington. You can see here this is in um, this was in 2020. So there are a lot of experiments which is going on in terms of the electric propulsion system. And of course, as we know that the challenge is the battery. Like it's okay maybe for the cars um, because the cars can stop on the road. It's different compared to the vehicles on the road compared to the airplanes. So we have to ensure that the um, the, the technology is reliable and strong and also other uh, aspects that um, also which is being uh, researched is also by using hydrogen fuel. Okay, now we come to operational improvements. Uh, the picture here we see is the uh, Etihad Airways uh, Dreamliner, which is also called the Green Liner because it's green. In the sense is this is the Dreamliner and it's also been used for the Boeing's Eco, as a Boeing's uh, Eco Demonstrator aircraft, where they have fitted so many types of sensors, hundreds of speakers, just to find out what can be done in order to be sustainable. So the first operational improvement that the aviation does is the weight reduction. Second is the air traffic management and um, the flight management. So from the operations perspective, we know that the weight reduction, they start reducing so many weights, the lake rest is being reduced, the amount of portable water that is being um, carried is also now optimized to only a sector base and the number of people on board, right? Not just purely this sector, I need to put 80% of water maybe previously, they said that for this particular sector, uh, the, um, they need to put 80% of water, but then during the COVID, it didn't make sense, right? Because there was zero passengers. To a point, it came to zero passengers, and the aircraft still had to carry about, you know, like let's say 1,000 kilograms of water, portable water, which is hardly is being used. So that is weight. So now we can actually optimize the amount of water that is being carried by number of passengers. You know, there are smart systems which is being developed. Air traffic management system, flight management, required navigation precision. All this is introduced in order to have, make the uh, navigation more precise, right? For example, we call it RNP. RNP capable aircrafts can calculate its position within a circle radius of 
the certain nautical miles, and it can bring up the uh, total system error accuracy to almost 95%. There are some stations, uh, for example, some stations where they must have RNP, only RNP approach. Without the RNP, that's going to be a problem even to land in that particular place, right? So all the airlines are now adopting RNP in order to save the cost itself. Sustainable aviation fuel is a, is a, is a very big topic, uh, which will be discussed by other speakers. And in general, one of the pillars of sustainability is the renewable energy source. It, and uh, currently has a market of about 5%, and it's projected to increase by 10% by 2030. SAFs, basically, they do not contain any hydrocarbons or sulfur, right? thus reducing the shoot. NPM, particulate matter, as byproducts of combustion. Right? So this causes few ice crystals to form at higher altitudes. So what are the different types of SAFs? How have they been evolving? In the first generation, we were using food crops, vegetable oil, right, including palm oil, soybeans. They are readily available. Right? But so but then what happened is they found that in poor countries, they don't even have food to eat, but then we are taking away their food in order to make fuel. Right? That is the first generation. Now, second generation is non-food sources, right? What, what we can grow, like for example, algae. Jatropha, halophytes, these are more complex and costly, and also they are more sustainable than, than food crops, of course, right? And uh, it reduces the GHG more than the first generation because it uses less landmass. And the third generation is bioengineered bacteria, algae, and hydrogen from the biomass. Uh, I think there is a speaker who's going to speak about the biomass tomorrow. A fantastic topic. Make sure everybody's tuned in. Or synthetic methane. Even methane can be made synthetically, right? In the lab. If they can do it in the lab, so why not? It's still under RD and it's actually the most promising area. Now, and um, as I discussed, I'm going to slowly talk about, uh, just briefly talk about IPCC. What is IPCC, right? IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change or Climate Change. Uh, they were introduced in um, 1988, it's under the United Nations Environmental Program. So what happens is IPCC, every five to seven years, they actually organize all the scientific assessments and then they publish a literature on scientific climate. Like when you go into the IPCC website, you'll find all the previous reports, right? So they call it assessment reports, ARs. AR1, 2, 3, 4. The current AR that we have is AR6, which was published um, the first um, AR6 came out last year. They have different different working groups, which we will see shortly. Different different working groups, different their own publishing uh, their assessment reports, which is all available now. We go to the IPCC, IPCC website. You can actually download the assessment reports. They have very big reports. The reports can run to hundreds of thousands of pages. They also have the summary of the reports, which you can read, which is also quite uh, quite useful. And it uh, contains scientists from all over the world. IPCC themselves, they do not have scientists. So they, they, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a volunteer basis. So a lot of scientists volunteer to become a part of them, right? So it's many, many scientists. Uh, they are not only limited to their own reports. They also read about all the published journals, the thousands of published journals that they go through. And um, there are a lot of participation from different types of people. So the role of IPCC is to assess on a comprehensive, objective, open, you know, to be um, open. They use scientific, technical, social, economical information in order to assess and then give up the assessment report, right? And they also go to different, different types of, uh, from the science to the effects and to the mitigation, which we will see in a while. Right. So IPCC report should be neutral with respect to the policy, although they may need um, they need to deal objectively with the scientific and technical and sociological factors. These are what we call sustainability. Okay, the IPCC working groups. There are three working groups in IPCC itself. Yeah? Because if you go to the website, sometimes it's too confusing. Too many things about IPCC. We don't know where to start from. They have working group number one, purely scientists. They do all the research. Right, so um, lots and lots of research, 
and they come out with their assessment report. Then we have working group two, which who then the uh, they assess the report and find out what is the impact on the climate change, right? By looking at the ecosystems, biodiversity, and in terms of human communities at the global, regional levels, right? They also review the vulnerabilities and the capabilities and limits of the natural world and the human societies, basically. They do a great job to find what is the impact. And the third group, right? These may not be scientists. These are people like us, like engineers. I mean, some of you are scientists. We are like engineers and um, so on. So the working group three, they actually, what they do is uh, they provide the updated global assessment and they find mitigation, like how to reduce it. So that's what we do, right? We do in aviation, like for example, us, we are as engineers. So what do we do? We do digitization. Uh, we do a lot of process, improvements, weight reduction in order to mitigate. The, if the, what we do is mitigate. So we fall into this section, mitigation of the global emissions, right? It explains developments in emissions reduction and mitigation efforts, assessing the impact of national climate pledges in relation to the long-term emissions goal. So um, in brief about, uh, we have spoken about the effects of greenhouse gas and why CO2 and how does IPCC come into action? Right, and uh, IPCC is all about sustainability, which is again a big one. And IPCC looks at all these aspects of sustainability, and um, it is also environment. So all of our discussion just now was about the uh, mostly it, it is the environment, CO two reduction, local air quality. As we know that um, you know at a lower altitude, the jet engines are not really good. It's really bad pollutants. Can you just imagine what happens every time? Uh, when we have haze, right? And when the burning of these oil palms in Indonesia and it brings the haze, right? These are the people who want to destroy the farms through burning rather than clear, they, they want to clear the land through burning because it's cheaper rather than, you know, in a controlled manner. It's cheaper, right? It's profit. It's all about corporations making profits, right? And then we also have the social impact and we have economical impact. And then we have between them, we can see Industry 4.0, which is really driving the sustainability. And we have digital transformation. And all of them are connected. No, nothing is on its own. Nothing. Now the question again comes is, is CO2 really bad? Do we need to jump from one bowl, like the goldfish? Right? In one, you can see here, you know, this is the dystopian society. Right? It's like watching Matrix. And then you jump to the beautiful blue sky with green earth. Is it really that bad? Yeah, the, the, the founder of CO2 itself, the carbon dioxide, the scientist, Arrhenius, actually he said the CO2 itself in a controlled manner, it's good. It's actually in, in, in short term, it's good for the earth because it prevents the ice age from happening again. Right? CO2 is so important even for plants. The plants, they breathe in CO2 and they emit oxygen. And, and in reality, they have also seen that um, the amount of the, the concentration of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere increases from December until May. But however, between July onwards, it, the, the concentration reduces, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere reduces. And they found that because it is being absorbed by the Northern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere has all this, you know, they are away from, when they reach, uh, they are away from winter, and they are entering the uh, autumn and summer, all these trees, they start absorbing. So the nature actually gives all this CO2 to that part of the earth, right? The CO2 itself is very, very important. If without CO2, what is earth, right? We don't have greens, we have nothing, just nothing but barren land. All right, so in conclusion, the planet will surely be a better place if all the airlines and operators take responsibility for achieving net zero carbon by 2050. It's not even negative. Net zero by 2050. The dream of a clean sky is never an individual effort. As the saying goes, no man is an island. Similarly, only through deep, 
collaboration can we achieve the real goal together we are stronger uh, ladies and gentlemen so um, thank you very much that is the end of my slide okay thank you